a leader in event education, the Event Leadership Institute offers on-demand video classes, interviews with industry mavericks, and online instructor-led professional development courses taught by industry experts. Visit eventleadershipinstitute.com for more information and to see a schedule of upcoming classes. Okay, are you, are you a nine, eight, okay seven, so we're going to yeah. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Executive Editor Beth Kormanik. Hi, David. Hey, Beth, here we are. It's uh, Super Bowl's coming up. That's right. And as everyone is busy planning their Super Bowl parties, we are bringing a really timely interview to our listeners. Uh, Frank Supovitz is the former senior vice president of events for the NFL. And in that role, he planned the Super Bowl, uh, among other high profile events for the league. Uh, he has since launched his own planning company, uh, Fast Traffic Events and Entertainment. And he still works with the Super Bowl host committees as well as you know with other high profile events like the indianapolis 500 uh, and i'll note that he's not limited to sports either um you know frank was named a biz Bash innovator in 2014 and i remember when i interviewed him at the time getting a sense of the balance between the the inertia and the magnitude of the super bowl uh, but also the nimbleness and flexibility that he needed to pull it off yeah no this is uh, i was very very impressed with this interview uh and it turned out that we didn't plan to go to the place where we went, but it is exactly uh, the moment when in old days he would be sitting there stressed out because we're a week before the Super Bowl. And what is it like? What was it like? And what was it like to be at the center of that experience? Right. So we are going to get into all of that, what it's like on, on game day and everything leading up to it. But if you're not a football fan and maybe you just watch for the commercials or the halftime show, uh, we're still going to cover a lot of relevant things for any event planner. Uh, we're going to talk about management style, mentors, training programs, problem solving, risk management, public safety and much more. Yeah, it is a universal truth. Yes. Yeah, so let's take a listen. So, Frank, um, we're here recording this in January. You ran NFL events for over a decade. What's going on at your old job right now? <laughs> well, my, my old job. Uh, Tell us what it was, too. Well, my old job was I, I was the senior vice president of events for the NFL and, and the, the Pro Bowl, the Super Bowl, uh, international games, the draft, the combine, all of that came under uh, un, under my area of responsibility um, right now. Uh, I would have been cut into two pieces. We're actually, uh, this is being recorded right before the Pro Bowl, actually. So so uh, at once, my successor is, is worried about what's going on in Orlando in terms of not just general event planning but you know also ticket sales and and you know, all of the all of the business aspects of of that event and then he's also of course thinking about uh what's going to be happening in in minneapolis just uh, a week later um yeah so he uh, you know super bowl actually starts four years ahead of time so at any given moment uh the nfl is planning three or four super bowls uh, and they're just in different stages of planning. Uh, right now in Minneapolis, they're not planning at all. They're in execution mode, and they've been installing uh, everything from international uh, broadcast booths and media, uh, uh, media lounges and, and the media center, uh, and loading in you know, party spaces and building new facilities uh, since January 2nd. Uh, what was really uh, difficult for them this year was uh, Minneapolis uh, uh, the Minnesota Vikings were actually in the playoffs and hosting games. So the, the stadium couldn't be entirely turned over on January 2nd. They, they would start actually two weeks later on much of that construction, which is, uh, you know, under any, any circumstances, not ideal. And so what, so, but at this point, as the, as the senior sort of person in that role, 
your job, if you're worrying about too many of the details at this point, you're in trouble, right? Or you're worried, you're, the executional side, you have organized it in a way that the, the delegation of work has to work pretty smoothly at this point. Well, right? it absolutely does because you've got, you've got major fan events, you know, fan festivals and parties, you know, hospitality events and media events and, and of course the main events, the, you know, the, the game and the halftime and all of that. All of that has to be, has to be delegated to some degree and on game day if you if you were to look at what i would do on game day i had very little direct responsibility uh, at that time because so much could go wrong in so many different places uh, you had to be able to respond to things and not be caught up in the details of of one thing or another uh, that would derail you from solving problems and and you know on on event day as every every one of us knows uh, you have to solve those things quickly and in real time. It's not something that you can you can solve tomorrow. What does it look like? Are you in a command center, or do you have headphones on? What is what is it What does it look like? What does the command center look like? Well, we call it we called it NFL control. I think they still call it that. And uh, it's a it's another booth that gets built in the stadium uh, that's not normally there. Uh, on my left, I would have typically had the uh, broadcast. Uh, manager, so the person who's talking to the truck, so that we can we could be sure we understand what's happening from a broadcast perspective. On my right, I would have the head of security, uh, and beyond them, the, you know, the chief of police and fire and EMS. And behind me, I would have the people working on the transportation systems, uh, gate control, stadium operations, you know, all of those things, football operations in, uh, as well. So you have the, you know, the pure football aspects of, of what a Super Bowl is. Then you have the production aspects, and then you have the logistical aspects, the operational aspects. All of that is in there. So it's probably about, I'd say, a couple dozen people in this and 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 we called it a booth, but it's it was way more than a booth. You know, we had little areas that we could go to 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 coordinate responses to issues and things. And what of that are you nature. looking at? What uh, uh, paint I'm, the I'm picture of what yeah. your, your your the game days happens? Yep. What time do you get there? What is your day like the day of the well, game? Well, it's a, it, typically it's a six thirty Eastern kickoff. Um, six. Generally, it was six twenty-eight thirty. You really <laughs> the, have to get the, precise on the time of day <laughs> clock. Yeah, because you're on television, so you have to you have to be ready at the exact right moment. Uh, I would I would have a headset on. I would have a communications panel, basically a giant clearcom system uh, that would be able to talk to uh, pretty much everybody who had an operational role. So so I'd be able to talk to the people who are handling the teams. I'd be I'd have a a, a series of ring down lines, a telephone. Uh, in, front of you, to, in front of you, you have yeah, right lines. Do you me. look? What are you physically looking, looking at? I'm looking at the field. You're looking at the field. Yeah, I'd be looking directly. And at the you field. have a monitor on one side or something. You have any uh, TV well, I'd monitors? Have, I'd have uh, security monitors above my head where I could look at different things around the stadium, and then I would also have a, a television feed, so I'd be able to see what what uh, people are seeing on television. And then what is your day like from from the time you get there? Uh, I would typically get there about eight in the morning and again, six, six, twenty eight, thirty kickoff. So it's a long day. Um, the the first thing I would do is uh, and I had a segue that I I, I would use for you, that you, purpose. You actually had because you had to get from place to place. Yes, really I, quickly. I, I would try to get around the entire stadium campus, which would include the giant tailgate party. You know, it's 10,000 people there, uh, all the media uh, facilities, all the operational facilities, all the gates. I would I would take literally take a spin around on the Segway and see just about everything and then ride myself up to the control center. Would you have an entourage? Or is it no. just you? Just you. Well, no, it it would be me because an entourage would be incredibly wasteful. Yeah. Um, you know, but I would meet with each of the people that were delegated the responsibilities to those areas. And did they have mirrored versions of what your command center was in their own operations? Or are they what does an event organizer, the person that's in charge, do in those particular areas? What does it look uh, like? Some somehow? of them had places where they would be able to oversee the operation of a of an entire um, uh, event footprint, uh, for example, the tailgate party is a, you know, again, 10,000 people and then a, you know, major concert and some television comes from there as well. Uh, they would have an office or an overlook or something where they could manage that uh, media center would have again, a you know, kind of a back of house where where the media, uh, the people dealing with the media would would be able to uh, 
uh, you know, office and co- and coordinate their activities. Um, but I would let everybody know where I was going when I was getting there. And my job wasn't to go to their office. My job was to look around at what they're doing. And um, if you saw something that was out of line, how do you fix, how do you sort of make change on the spot? Or do you? Oh, uh, you, do. you? How yeah. do. How do you do that? You do what does it you look have like? to. Yeah, again, you, you don't have a lot of time. The clock is ticking. Um, and, and at Super Bowl in particularly, there's so many security protocols in terms of it being sealed off from the rest of the world, if you will. You, you can't get more things in that morning, right? right it all had right. to be inside that security perimeter before. So, you know, it, it's more tweaking and adjusting at that What does point. it look like? Like, you, what, where does your eye go first? Like, you're, you've got lots of experience. You probably haven't broken it down. Like, when you drive, you don't really know the an, 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 an analytics of what you're seeing. But you have a feeling of what you're what you're seeing. And if it's wrong, how do you Yeah, correct? sure. Well, some of it's aesthetics, as always. You like, know, move that sign or do that? Or some of it. Uh, you know, you start with safety first. Safety first um, you know, that's number always one. An, yeah, that's always a non-negotiable. So, right. so if it's something that could affect public safety, it could cause an injury, something like that. You deal with that right away. And that's what you're looking at first. Uh, first, foremost, and last. And everything. you know, every you sandwich everything in between. This that. is after this is the execution phase. You you're not oh, absolutely. you're not in any you're not going to change your mind on anything that was no, planned. Abso- <laughs> well listen, it could be as it could be as mundane as a carpet's not not taped down. Oh or, wow okay. You know, or it could be a guy wire that's about to <laughs> garrote somebody, you right. know, so so you look at all of those kinds of things and and you know, safety first, presentation second, um, and and uh, you know, staffing and execution sec- uh, third. Um, so you look at all those things. Uh, you know, remember on game day, you've got fourteen thousand people holding a credential. For, That's a how lot many people, of people are you, in your sort of bailiwick? 14, well, all four, well, fourteen thousand if you include everybody that has a, a an NFL in- issued credential on on game day. So that's. That's an enormous yeah. number of people. Now, not all of them are at the stadium. Right. You know, they're, they're at training centers and hotels and, you know, in, in the transportation system. Um, you probably have, I, I would say, 7,000 of those are inside the stadium campus somewhere. Um, so you're responsible for all of them. And you're, you're responsible for all 80,000 people who are in the stadium as well. Wow. So there, there's nothing that you can look at when you are in that level of a position where you can say, well, that's not really my job. Right. Right. Well, what's your, your command, what's your command structure look like? What I mean, you're really running an army, you know, a military operation. Like, what is the command structure look like underneath the senior event organizing person in charge of all this stuff? Well, there, there's two things. There's a side by side organization and then there's an, an organization below you. So the side by side organization is a team that you're part of. And, and I don't direct the football operations or I wouldn't direct the football operations department. I wouldn't direct the broadcast department. I wouldn't direct the security department, but I counted on all of them um, and they counted on me. And, and so the events group was kind of the, the control center in the middle of it all. But, but we had to coordinate everybody's, uh, you know, everybody's activities and we were dependent on them. Uh, for example, you know, we had to we had to determine when a game was actually over. Um, and the only way that we could do that um, is to get that signal from the officiating department or at, which would be talking to football operations a few seats away from me. What does that mean? If you watched the the playoffs this year, there was one touchdown at the end of the the Minnesota Vikings New Orleans Saints game at the very last second. And and media flooded this, the the uh, the field, thinking the game was over. Well, until you snap the ball for the extra point, and that's a football thing, until you snap the ball for the extra point, game's not over. So it took them, you know, seven eight minutes to clear the field, you know, which they had lost. There were already television correspondents out there interviewing people, and media had taken over. And before you know it, you've lost control over your event. The event, the game's not over. Now, at the Super Bowl, that would be cataclysmic because of the enormous number of people who are looking to flood the field at the end of that. I mean, you're talking thousands of people. So so in order to do the post game portion of the presentation, you have to make sure it's all over before you start moving staging out there and everything else, because if you need that snap, you need that snap to make it official. So that's just one element of a lot of different things that that, you know, could could possibly go sideways on you. And, but you're the ones pulling the trigger. Well, we're the ones that I mean, are the, are the central communicating yeah. 
body, if you will. So, so we make sure it's over before we start moving things onto the field and then security does its job. They're, they're sitting right beside me. So that's all the side by side silos, if you will, that are coming together in one point, which is that mm -hmm. command center. Mm -hmm. The, the events group itself was a, was a department of 27 people and and all of them were, you know, had a homeroom assignment, if you will, which was, you know, they're, they're taking care of hotel accommodations and transportation, they're taking care of ticketing, or they're taking care of um, uh, uh, stadium operations and stadium construction and those types of things. So everybody had a specialty. And those 27 people are the ones that I would talk to directly over the ClearCom system on any number of channels or, or uh, communications loops we would use but you have those 27 people but you also have a, an army of outside production companies and oh, things like that I assume. Yeah. so if you w how does that work i mean who, you, you would uh, what, they're part what's of the, the team, structure they're part of the team like the 27 right you know so you'd look at a call it the party planner that is in charge of the tailgate party for example although we had a staff person that was working with that co uh, yeah. contractor the contractors generally did not report directly to me they generally reported to one of the 27. Mm -hmm. so so the point to point communication is really important with the staff because those are the people you count on to respond quickly and they know what you're looking for and you develop a, a, a relationship with all of them the contractors are interchangeable to some degree although many of them ha were have been family members uh, team members for an enormously long time but generally i tried not to be their direct report well, person yeah it, it was it impossible. would always be one of the 27. Uh -huh. yeah. so, and so of those 27 how did that how did what's sort of the next level how, how did you structure your event department yeah there were there were uh, below, I was a senior vice president, so below me there were there were vice presidents and directors. By those various topics you, you uh, mentioned. Yeah, and each of them had a a, le a area of specialty. What was great about all of them is that they could do anything. They're, they're, they were great event generalists and managers, but they were expert in one or two particular things. So, you know, one would be more of a logistics person or really strong in logistics, and one would be really strong in televised events. So during the course of the year, because remember, Super Bowl's one Just event, one. Yeah. and you're, you're not planning that and then going on to the next thing and starting to plan that. You're planning a, a season long at you know, again, four years ahead of time, but in some cases a year ahead of time, the, 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 the draft is in the spring and you've got the combine in February and you had the Pro Bowl the week before. So, so you, you try to line people up with their areas of core expertise. So if I had something added to the program, for example, that had a really heavy television component, I would assign the person who was really good with television and really understood what television needed. So as that senior manager of that group, talent talent spotting was as important as being uh, spotting football talent. I, I would say <laughs> spotting, but also development. development I, think, yeah. I think development yeah. was really, really key because, you know, people people come into the world and into this business um, and they're 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 somewhat moldable in terms of you know where that where they have particular strengths if they have you know mathematical strengths or as you know aesthetic sense or things like that and then you develop it into the into the core competencies that you need for your business have you did you find any sort of common denominator of things that needed to be developed that people didn't have before they came in uh that you were able to sort of you know take your experience and sort of add it to theirs you know i think that the thing that's the hardest for um uh, anybody coming into the business and some people never achieve it. It's sort of, sort of like event nirvana, if you will. <laughs> some people get there and some people never do, but, um, it's, it's, it's the confidence in yourself to be able to spot a problem, solve a problem and not have to elevate it every time you see something wrong. Um, so there's, th there's that ability to have confidence enough in yourself that you can make the right decision. But, but then there's also the confidence in yourself not to lose your calm demeanor and your professional focus when things are really going wrong. And that, that's, that's a really common issue. Well, how do you, how do you develop for that? How do you, how do you sort of train somebody in that? Area? Well, as a manager, I think you have to actually instill that in people. And, and if I trust them, then they start to trust themselves more. 
So, so sort of the frenzy manager would just only makes things worse. Worse. Well, absolutely. Yeah. So let, let's look at a, you know, kind of a famous um, ex, uh, example of that, which was the blackout in New Orleans, right? So, so, you know, if you can imagine the worst day you've ever had at work and, and you get to um, experience it with 80,000 people, you know, <laughs> sitting around you, and then you've got 150 million people watching it on television. <laughs> it's a little you know, stressful. Yeah, it's a little, a little bit stressful. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's kind of a historic moment. And it's the number one watched television program of the year uh, in the United States. So what do you, you know, how do you, how do you try to try to get the plug back in the wall and, and start without, without at least a little bit of, of uh, panic. And, and the real key to that um, is, you know, understanding the problem before you can solve the problem and and handling it like you would handle any uh issue we actually uh had a tabletop you know crisis exercise 10 days before the super bowl every year with all of my managers so that we could kind of walk through how we would solve a problem it wasn't it wasn't the question of being having everything figured out but having anything figured out which is really a, a key difference say, say that again well you, in, in, in table, other words you go back to tabletop yeah what you, did you call it yeah you can't prepare for every eventuality but you can which are individual things like like a power failure for example but you can prepare yourself for any eventuality like what's gonna, you, which is something goes wrong how do you track down the solution and how do you handle it and how do you mobilize your forces to do that so um, in the 10 years that we did these tabletop exercises and we would go through six different scenarios uh, you know in a four-hour time period um, a power failure was never one of them until we were faced with a power failure and then we went into the same problem-solving mode as a group so it was very professional it was very calm it was i mean it was stressful on the inside right but but as a as a leader you can't panic and expect your troops to be able to handle a situation uh, calmly okay so so people are listening here and there's they're, they want to do it this type of exercise yep how do you as a leader lead that kind of exercise like well, get into a little bit more of the details for this audience and think they're actually interested in well it. I'll, I'll tell you i mean you hire a moderator um that that becomes familiar with your operations plan and your event plan um and and they go through and there's a little bit of homework here right this is what this is what used to drive my staff a little bit nuts he would want to sit with each of them for an hour or two and say okay uh, well, have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? And show me your plan. Show me your timeline. Show me your floor plans. And and how will this work? And how will that work? And they just want to. He just wants to know. This moderator just wants to know. It, you know, kind of what the what the overall plan is, as and many details as possible. Then we sit in a room, cell phones off, and and he says, okay, it's nine o'clock in the morning, and the parking lot where your staff is parking to be bussed into the stadium um, is now uh, is at the airport and there's been a plane that has skidded off the runway and now the airport is sealed off that parking lot which was at the end of the runway is no longer available now that sounds really detailed right but and it was and that was an actual exercise um, it wasn't important that that it was detailed. What was important was, okay, now we have a problem early in the morning. We have to contact our staff to tell them where to park. We have to find a place for them to park, then contact them all. Do we have a way to do that? Right? So you tease out all of the, all of the parts of your plan that haven't been fully enough developed. So it wasn't about the airplane. Yeah. It's all about the process. You're basically doing simulations. How, how do I talk to yes. these 14,000 people at nine o'clock in the morning on game day if I have to get to all of them right and and so that's how we we developed more plans and a more robust response plan every time we did one of these exercises but the, the, from the beginning of the time that you did these exercises uh, and how do people how do people get better at what they do they just is, is the exercise actually build upon each other because you must that first time you do it you're probably creating the wrong you don't really know what you're doing it actually doesn't matter that it's added it's not as additive 
Okay. Um, what's really important, and this, and the reason we did it at all, I, I introduced that that program in two thousand six. Brilliant, by the way. <laughs> um, well, uh, that remains to be seen. Well, I mean, it worked for the blackout. Yeah, you know, but I mean, it, it does blackout. make people. I mean, it's kind of like the military uses that all the time, simulations well, it, and things like it that. Really, games. it was really important for our business yeah. because the Super Bowl moved from year to year. Yeah. So you'd have in in the command center in the NFL control, you might have fifty percent of the those people have worked together before and 50% of them haven't. Yeah. So during that exercise, you're also establishing a command and control structure that is visible to all so that the chief of police knows how good or not good you are at making decisions and what kinds of things you're going to take on and what kinds of things you're not able to take on. And so by the end of that four hours, there was there was a real sense of not only relief because you were done with the four hours of crisis, but you were also, um, you've also created a team that's going to work together really well when the chips are down. And, and there have been numerous times when the chips were down, some very public, some less public. And, and, you know, those are the things you have to deal with. So it, it does, it, it, what it does is it creates a team and the, and the, the tone and tenor of how a team works starts with the leadership. And I wasn't, I'm not talking about just me. I'm talking yeah, about the whole thing. everybody who was up there because if, if, if you're panicking, you're, you're paralyzing decision-making, you, you can't get anything done that, that people won't question. If you're saying, okay, here's what you do. When something goes wrong, people want to know what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Right. If you sound stressed and nervous and, and panicky, they either um, they either think you don't know what to do and you're just kind of making stuff up, <laughs> which is really bad, um, or you know that they they feel like things are going to hell in a handbasket and you have to you, you just have to establish that level of of calmness across the team and having a good having a good team and and confidence in your team helps you. Well, do how that. about you as the senior person? I mean, do you fake it till you make it type of thing? Because you, because it must be really, even to go into a simulation, you're thinking as the leader, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Uh, am I going to be good enough? I mean, because it, is, is it stressful on that level to be the leader in, the, in those things? Oh, it's incredibly stressful. Yeah. The question is, how, go. how, how good are you? Well, you called it fake it until you make it. And I, I guess you could call it that. I, I would call it... Um, I would call it internalizing your your stress <laughs> and fear. and making sure you know it's like the old deodorant commercial never let them see you sweat yeah exactly you know and that's that's part, that's a part of a leadership yeah. role right so who, who do you hire to, i mean do you have any recommendations on people that do this kind of thing that really experts in our business well i, mean, I i've done it to some yeah, degree probably, myself yeah. but now nowadays yeah. but but uh yeah i do have and and i can certainly provide them to you i wouldn't yeah. i wouldn't give you that over the sure over no, absolutely the but you know but the thing is i think people will ask well, okay yeah there are who do you call there are risk management people who are would that really would it be good a risk man what would you call primarily this? a security slash risk consultant the, okay. the, the, the when i have done it uh for various groups it's been more of a logistical and and uh uh, you know, crowd flow kind of a exercise because I've, I've I've become expert in those types of things, um, but but when it when there's a security and law enforcement component to it, you really want to have a security consultant do it. Okay, great. Well, so let's now let's let's leave the Super Bowl and move a little bit into what you're doing now and what you've learned from your experience from all these different aspects, which you which which I'd like to actually have you start with what your first job was and and how your thinking has changed between the first job and today. You know, I'd like to tell you that my thinking hasn't changed. Really? Uh, That's yeah, it really hasn't. Um, and, and I'll tell you why and you'll get it right away. It, it, I, I'm from New York City. So, you know, the, the land of opportunity, you can do almost anything even after high school. And then, you know, I did. Uh, did you do I, this in high school? I was. I found usher. that almost everybody yeah. that I've talked to have experience in high school and college doing this. I, I was an usher at Radio City Music Hall. Wow. And at the age of 15. And and I was at Radio City for 16 years after that. Wow. In various capacities. Um, and and so th it, you can start with that as the place where I learned a lot about a lot. Um, and and here's what I learned that 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 I hasn't changed from that point is that when you have and you can have an enormously successful business of billions of dollars worth of revenue 
almost always the person who is interacting with your guest is the least paid and the least appreciated person on the totem pole. And I was a $2 an hour usher at Radio City in 1973. And I, I was very proud of being that. You know, I had the white gloves and the great uniform. <laughs> you can call it a great uniform if you want. Um, but they also really instilled in us a level of appreciation for what service meant to your, to your guest. And I've never forgotten that. And so, you know, you do these enormous events like Super Bowl or the Indy 500 or something like that, but you can never forget that the person who is experiencing your event is your lifeblood. It, it's all about the, the live content, how it's delivered, but also it's about the environment you're creating, the pain points you're taking away, you know, the, the, the journey that people take to your facility right from the time they leave their home to the time they get back. And, and I learned that there. Um, and I also learned about crowd control there because, you know, we had 6,000 people coming for a show. Now, back in those days, it was a movie and a stage show and it was continuous performances. So you'd have, which meant you'd buy a ticket, you'd go in, you'd sit and you watch the show and you'd, and the, the next 6,000 people were lined up outside on 50th street waiting to come in. Right. So 6,000 people leave the next 6,000 people come in simultaneously over a 20 minute period. And so you learned how to handle masses of people and how to communicate with masses of people and working in a stadium is no different. from So, that. so go back to that. Who was, did you have like a mentor usher that taught you like, you know, I did. Frank, do this, don't do this. I, who was it? Tell us who it his is. name, his name was, his name was Frank. Um, uh, FJ was his name, uh, FJ in Cantalupo. And he, he was, I'll never forget what he told me the first day. And it, and it was really important. He said, and it sounds weird that it's important, but it is. He said, I may yell at you, be, but it means that it's important. It doesn't mean I'm angry at you. Oh, that's a very interesting, subtle difference. And, you know, it was, it was the way he said that. And by the way, FJ could go off pretty well. But then I always remembered what he told me my very first day of work. It was, so, it was so important for him to tell me what his management style is. He was the usher captain um, my first day of work. And, and I've never forgotten it, right? Now, I don't, I don't yell, generally. Um, in, if, if I yell, you know something really bad, yeah, really bad. <laughs> just happened. But, but you know, I, I meter that a, a great deal, and, and I approach things relatively calmly. So... So, you know, large groups of people don't bother me. People yelling at me don't bother me. Um, providing good service in the heat of the moment doesn't bother me. I think they're all important things. And I learned all of that my very first week of working as a 15-year-old. Wow. So what was the other things he said? This Frank, this Frank sounds like he was a great... He was, he was uh, terrific. You know, they had a great group of guys that, that worked there. They, you know, we were all, you know, kids from primarily Queens and Brooklyn right that that uh that came in and um you know our it was it, we had a, a sign language um because you you had to be able to communicate over the large distances of radio city which is a block wide right but you can't you can't yell across the lobby so you would use hand signals what were some of the hand, hand signals? Uh, i can show them to you well, but nobody else is going to see them you tell us what uh, <laughs> imagine tell us uh, well, what you, they are you would actually with hand signals you would be able to say that that there are 100 seats left in aisle a for example uh or 150 uh, 150 seats in aisle g uh or you know get me a manager in aisle b those and I just gave you all the signals. Right. No, nobody, nobody listening can, see can hear but that. Are you using? Did you use any of that throughout the rest of your career? That kind I, of thinking. No, I, no, it's interesting. No, I didn't because you know now we have clear comms and walkie talkies. Yeah, exactly. Like that. <laughs> but sometimes surveillance you can hear. kits. Yeah. Surveillance kits. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's remarkable. When I mean, you had those I'm, signs, I'm 60 I, years old. And I remember the hand signals from when I was. And 15. you just did them perfectly in front of me. Yeah. As well, if it was uh, sign well, language. You, you wouldn't know that it was perfectly, well, but, but it, it looks, was. It looked like you were talking, <laughs> it looked like it made sense. Yeah, so I, you know, I haven't forgotten any of that. And, and I, I think the real central thing, if, if you look at just one thing, yeah. it's that, again, the, the, 
the person who is the least paid, least in, least appreciated is the one that is interacting the most with your guests. So you have to get them on board with why it's important that what they're delivering is is essential to your business. So has that translated to how you do your briefings and things like that? Or your people do your briefings? Do you have a certain Absolutely. protocol around that? Yeah. So so um, in in 2011, we had a miserable Super Bowl. It was a, it just name the thing that could go wrong, and it did. Uh, so afterwards, we we determined that we would look at everything we did, um, you know, from where a bus drops people off and what people experience between where they, the bus drops you off and where you come into the gates, how long you wait at the gates, um, you know, every element of your experience. <clears throat> and we determined that, that we weren't doing a great job of that. So, you know, when something goes wrong, you, you don't, at least I didn't just look at the one thing that went wrong or the five things that went wrong. I look at everything and say, okay, what else is going wrong that we're not hearing about? And so we looked at everything. And so we created a, a program called Fans First. And, and that program was a training program for my team first. Uh, and we did it with the Disney Institute. We brought them in and they have a great training program, but it was very Disney-esque. And we wanted to translate it to the football world, which is, which is very, very different. So we worked together with them to create it. Um, first, we trained our staff, then we trained our contractors, then we trained the 14,000 people. Um, and and that's, that's a tall order, right? To get them uh, to buy into, they may work for you for one day, to buy into why this is so important that they're part of history and you know the memory that people are gonna take away could either be great or you could be the fly in the pie, right? You could you could be the reason people didn't have a great So what does that look I, I'm gonna go back to what does that look like? How do we how do you explain what that is to people that are listening? We we did it in a way where we didn't want people to feel like they were being trained, so we actually created an a um, uh, an arena show that that cleverly disguised training and entertainment uh, you know so we brought in cheerleaders and we brought in players and we brought in other things but but they all the reason they were there all related to a particular message we were putting out for that that call it five or ten minutes worth of training message um, and we 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 as much told them you know you are you you may not work for the NFL but as far as the 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 rest of the world that is coming to see us is is concerned you do right you work for the nfl so you should be proud of that you should be proud that you're part of something very historic very important you know it's a reflection on your team it's a reflection on you it's a reflection on your fandom you know that you're going to be providing this level of service and and i would say it really worked then we we had reward systems with uh you know cards that that our management team would hand out to people with codes on it, and, and it would say, "Congratulations, you were you were caught doing something right." Um, and then they would register, and you know they could get prizes. We had we had challenge coins that we created that we would give to people who were out of control, wonderful. So you know, there's a lot to a training program. But it, it, when you say training, I'm just wondering if this is sort of a trend that we're seeing everywhere. Is training learning the actual thing, or is training a feeling you get? that enables you to dig deeper into the topic. It was not about how, what your job was. Right. It wasn't about what your job was and how you were gonna do it. It was, it was, on, it was how you were going to comport yourself on that day. Right. That was right. the most important thing. Right. I, I'm not gonna be able to train a security guard on what he's, he or she is gonna do, but I want them to be as good at what they do and as welcoming to our guests if they are standing in the middle of the street looking at a, at a manhole cover for right. four hours right. as if they're taking you to your seat. Well, because I'm, I'm doing this for the NFL, which I have a tremendous pride in, so I better do this right. That's, that's the message. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's incredible. So as we sort of end this, um, you, you left the NFL after it seems like it was not a very stressful job, obviously. <laughs> not not, not <laughs> I mean, You seem very happy. <laughs> uh, what is going on now? People are, are, are calling you all the time. Um, I see you at meetings. You're always somewhere because people want your wisdom and your knowledge and your innovation. What is your new company look like and how do people get in touch with you and all that stuff? Well, I, I'm at uh, Fast Traffic Events. Um, so it's fasttrafficevents.com. And you the named website. it Fast Traffic because? Oh, that's really funny. Uh, 
most people don't even ask that, but I'll tell you, and it's really un, uninteresting. Um, so the first, the first uh, three letters are my initials. Uh, traffic was it, I was the traffic manager at Radio City. It was the oh, first. So we're still it was going the, back to Radio it City. It was the first <laughs> salary job I had uh -huh. when I was promoted out of being an usher captain. Uh -huh. Um, so it was the first management management job I had, and um, you know back in those days you typed things, yeah. right? You didn't you didn't have computers, so I part of my job as the traffic manager was to type the telephone extension list and distribute it to people. And at the bottom, I would put my initials FAS slash traffic, which was my department. That's what it would say at the bottom of the page, so they would know who typed it. And then, and then the the percussionist from the orchestra, no joke, who was the, also the shop steward, looked at it one day and he said, "Fast traffic, that's funny." And it just stuck with me. And I said, <laughs> one day, if I if I run my own business, that's, that's right. what it's going to be called. It's amazing how it yeah. comes down to those moments. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, now, interestingly sure. enough, um, uh, fast track. My first client was the Indy Five Hundred. Um, and so I produced the pre-race show for them. I, I had done a, a bit of work on the organizationally with them on how to better manage their events at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And then that grew into a more um, a, a more robust job with them, which is which was reconfiguring, redesigning and producing the, the pre-race show for the Indy 500, which I do, uh, which I've done the last three years uh, and doing again this year. So. Um, you know, people thought that fast traffic related to the Indy 500, which it really doesn't. But but I'm not going to tell them that necessarily. Well, actually, the name that. the name fits with almost everything. Everything is fast. Everything's about you know getting traffic and moving people yeah, moving and people changing through. things. Yeah, and moving people. So it through. kind of kind of fits once you understand it. Yeah. So you know, you can always find me through the through the website fasttrafficevents.com. Um, I'm working on the Indy 500, as I mentioned. I I've actually uh, been involved in venue design and. Um, and from both an operational and architectural standpoint, uh, in terms of making sure the right infrastructure is in place to make an, a venue event ready. Uh, so I've been working at the South Street Seaport for three and a half years and Pier 17 in particular, which is going to open uh, this spring. Uh, I'm working with the Milwaukee Bucks on a similar project outside their arena. They're building an entertainment plaza and an entertainment block. Um, that will feed the arena. So I'm not working in the arena. I'm working on everything outside right. the arena as an example. I want to end on, we had a, a conversation uh, last year with a group of people and you talked about experiential marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we in the event industry sometimes think we're in the middle of experiential marketing, but you had a very, very poignant comment that we're one piece of that. Yes, we are. Can you talk about your theory of experiential marketing? And it also comes back to you kind of being the guy who is at Radio City talking to people. So it seems like it's like there's a through line through all of this. Well, everything we do is experiential. You know, it, it's it's the circle, rec I'm sorry, it's the, uh, it's the rectangle square conversation. You know, a, a, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle doesn't have to be a square. Um, events are experiential marketing. But experiential marketing doesn't have to be an event. It can be. It can be expressed in other ways. Um, it's it's creating an experience that sends out a message or promotes a product or service, and that's what experiential marketing is. Experiential marketing could be as mundane as uh, a. a a clown handing you a balloon outside the railroad station that you know has a message on it that's to me that's a promotion and not an event but it's experiential in the sense that someone got in your way stopped you from what you were doing changed your experience that morning and and hopefully you got the message of what they were trying to say um, experiential marketing is also increasingly happening in the digital space so how you engage with things that come at you on your on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, or how you experience them because you visited something that way rather than it getting pushed into you can also be experiential. So, you know, the user experience is a term that everybody uses. I, I kind of look at the user experience more broadly, I think, than most event people do. Um, and I truly think that that events need to think about that because how you experience a 
bit of live content, whether it's a sports event or a theatrical event or a corporate entertainment or a hospitality program, um, there may be digital aspects to that that you shouldn't be afraid of as a live event producer or promoter. You, you just need to incorporate it because that's what people want. That's what they do. And, and you know, when, when I get a chance to talk about that with people, because I do a fair amount of public speaking, you know, I, the, the, the question I ask people 15 minutes in is how many of you have not looked at your iPhone since I started talking? <laughs> and the answer is nobody. I, I don't take that personally. That's just the way people yeah. multitask yeah. today and they yeah. dip in and out of different kinds of realities, different the physical reality yeah. and the and the digital realities yeah. so that they control. So the physical reality, they don't the digital reality, they do. So you think that I would assume that anybody in the event space is no longer just in the event space. They have to be experts in the whole realm. No, they're in the event space, but they're not in the live event space alone. alone I, I yeah. think I think events are still a great a great category or title or or descriptor of of an experience that that today is based on live content, but what events really are are special moments. Uh, Bob Yanni said that years ago, right? It's what makes every day, it's what makes a day different from every other day. That's what an event is. And, and so it's a sense of urgency and timing that you're asking people to go to a place physically or digitally and, and engage at a particular time. It's an appointment that, that you are trying to get people to keep. Great. Well, with that said, Frank, thank you so much for being on Gather Geeks, and we look forward to future conversations. This, I have 10 other conversations I want to have with you uh, based on this interview today. I've enjoyed thank it, you. David. Thanks for having me. Thanks, David. We'll talk about the spotlight being on you as a planner or a producer at the Super Bowl. It's the most watched event of the year. And, you know, I'll note here that Frank was succeeded by Peter O'Reilly in the role of senior vice president for events at the NFL. And we wish him well for the game coming up on February 4th in Minneapolis. Uh, so, David, what was your biggest takeaway from the conversation? I think how intricate it was and how it was like running a huge orchestra uh, and how you have to be calm uh, and that he had all sorts of techniques that he used to operate, uh, to manage all these 14,000 people at one time for the Super Bowl and all the other events at the same time that happened. And uh, it was really, really interesting how he says he's not a screamer and he stays calm all the time. And it, I, I think I learned a ton about about how to how to really do it right. Yeah, you set the tone from the top and the the size and scope of the game make this makes this i kind of think of it like an event production on steroids um but the insights that frank brought can be applied to any number of jobs in the industry uh you know what does your reporting structure look like uh you know in any other number of logistical questions that you need to think about um I'm also fascinated about his current work on venue design. I mean, what, shouldn't event producers have a Absolutely. say in how a space functions? You'd think that the first person that an architect would go to would be an event designer, but it doesn't really happen that much. And Frank is going to lead, sort of leading the charge in that. Right, doing that as a consultant. Um, but you know, a trend that we've seen is, is when um, event producers open up their own venues. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that, and they want to make them masterpieces. Right. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, totally. So we'll keep an eye on on all of that coming up. So, Beth, what's going on at BizBash? Well, we're planning our own Super Bowl coverage. Uh, keep an eye out for our stories about how the biggest brands activated during the game, as well as our popular post-game story about how event producers graded the halftime show. I always love getting the insights there. Uh, so this year, Justin Timberlake returns as the headliner, and I know I'll be tuned into that. Yep, everybody's getting their nachos ready. That's right. That's right. Yeah, well, we uh, have plenty of stories about Super Bowl catering, so uh, those are in our archive as well. So if you need last-minute ideas, um, hop on to bizbash.com. See you next week, David. And gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. 
We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. Invest in yourself and your staff with self-paced online event education designed to fit into your busy schedule. Subscribe to the Event Leadership Institute for only $25 per month and gain access to an extensive on-demand video library of classes, as well as interviews with industry leaders. Best of all, you can watch classes in small pieces or all at once. For more information, visit eventleadershipinstitute.com.